I was talking with uh, Verna today. She was saying, you know, they've got 200 kids this year for the ELC, which is big. But she's saying they had, we had our, our first flu case already. I'm like, oh, no, no, no. Yeah, 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 yesterday, first flu case. I'm like, oh, my goodness, that's, I don't want to hear that. So. Where did you get those cool shoes? Yeah, Toms, these are Toms, Star Wars shoes. That's why I like them. Yeah, it's got a bunch of little Star Wars stuff on it. I'm a Star Wars fan from the beginning. Yes. I would say I was from the beginning, but I, you know, if that was 78, I, I didn't come around until 79, but it's from the beginning, I could be the beginning I have been. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, do, I, find, I was telling somebody today, with Star Wars, oh, you are awesome, yes. No, you're fine. I tried to use this chair. No, no. They, uh, I find with Star Wars, people are either, you really like it, or you're just not, it doesn't do it for you at all. There's no kind of in-between. I tried Try to get my wife like watch these. No, that's not her thing. Yeah, nothing like it. Yeah, well, I love them. So, all right. Well, we'll go ahead and get going. I know uh, we'll have some folks that are beating the traffic or wherever they're coming from. will file in like they normally do. But I want to open up with a word of prayer and uh, have some uh, prayer requests, praises, things that are going on in our lives, an opportunity to go before the Lord and uh, and uh, open up our time before him what can we be praying about this evening as we come together per request yes the end of the end of the word come come lord jesus come you said three that was only two <laughs> I'm, unless i missed the third one in there but that was good what else can we yes ma'am oh okay oh my goodness so praying for sure yes oh okay yeah well definitely they, they find out what it is whatever it is yes uh, a stress test for her daughter Sierra just having some uh, heart issues and they're going to do a stress test tomorrow to kind of figure out potentially what it is so here. yes Dave Yeah, 
Yes. Yeah. And those are just the ones we know of. My goodness, you know, the ones we know of. What else? What else can we be lifting up? All right. Oh, yes. Uh, my brother. Okay. Okay. Um, and we're not quite sure if he's not finished yet because he's more complicated with the things that are going on. Okay. Um, but he struggles with religion. Um, so I'm really just hoping he did try to go to church, but uh, he said it was kind of like a joke. They don't really take it serious. They just use it for like social business in it. Um, sure. So I'm just hope that he finds the Lord while yeah. he's there. Absolutely, we'll be be praying for him. I think most of the time, those are the uh, God works like that. I don't know how to explain it. You know, I didn't we didn't go to church. The first time I went to church is I could have cared less about the church, but they were inviting people to play basketball. Uh, you know, so I was there for basketball, and they were giving away hot dogs. And same thing, I kind of was like, yeah, I I don't know, I had all kind of thoughts about church and stuff, and uh, I don't know. I stayed long enough to meet some other people. I was like, oh, they're not weirdos. And that was how it started. I was like, well, they're not weirdos. I could hang out with these guys. And after that, I started listening to what they would say. God works in the strangest ways. And sometimes when we pray, God, do whatever it takes, we would never pray that someone would go to prison. But maybe that's what it takes. Maybe what it takes. We'll be praying for sure that God's will be done, but that he would be, we would come to know the Lord. We'd come to know the Lord. Yes. Anything else we can be praying about? Awesome. Well, let me lift this up in prayer and we'll jump into it tonight. Father, we... We thank you. You've given us this opportunity. We know that we have busy days. We know that we are coming from all kinds of, of places. And, and Father, we do. We pray for, uh, well, first of all, God, we just thank you. We thank you because you are awesome, because you are wonderful, because you are glorious, because, God, you are above all things. And, Father, that gives us peace. It gives us comfort. Uh, and, Father, we are thankful not just for who you are, but how you love us in Christ Jesus, that we have a, we have a living hope. We have a living hope that is secure and sure and guarded. Um, and that you have sealed that with the, the promise of your Holy Spirit in our lives. And so, God, we thank you, God. We do come before you and recognize that we're not you and that we have issues and that, God, we have sin and we have needs. And, and we've lifted some of those up in this place, Father. We lift those up, just the ones we've heard now, the ones that are represented, Father, unspoken ones in this group. God, we have people that are in their car right now and they're trying to make their way here or they're trying to get home. God, we just, we know that if we are here on this planet, we have issues and we have needs, and we know that you have told us that we can come before your throne. And so, God, we do. Whether that's physical or relational or mental, God, spiritual, we come to you and we just ask that you would move and you would work in our lives for your glory so that your name would be made great among the nations. But, God, we ask for healing. We ask for wisdom. We ask for peace. God, we just pray that... Um, you would receive all the glory. God, we pray now as we open your word that you would speak to us, that you would teach us, and that it would move us to obedience. We pray this, Jesus, because of you, and in your name, amen. Awesome. Well, I want you to open up to 1 Peter chapter 1, and we're going to look as we keep going here in verse 13. Um, tonight is, is simple. It's simple, and, and probably will not take all of our time, but I want us to make sure that we, uh, we pay attention tonight. It's super practical. Like I said, we kind of set the stage for we're going to where we've been and what Peter's trying to cover. I was reading a story this week um, that kind of encapsulates what Peter, I think, is trying to accomplish in this letter to these exiles and what he's trying to accomplish with these people and what he's trying to accomplish with us. I was reading a story about two uh, men in a German concentration camp in World War II. A very interesting, very true story uh, where one man who was writing this says he remembers a day where a friend of his in the camp came to him and said that he had had this bizarre dream. He had this bizarre dream, a voice out of nowhere in his dream. He said it was so real that he believed it was really somebody talking to him. Told him that if he would ask, anything he would ask, he would get the answer to. And so this man who's recounting this story said, well, I just kind of played along. I was like, well, what did, what did you ask? And he said, well, I asked, when would the war be over for us? And what he meant by that is not just the war, but when would it be over for us? When will we get out? When will we go home? When, when will this all end for us here in the camp? And, and he said he kept asking questions. He's like, I'm curious. He said, so what did the mysterious voice say to you? And he said, he said, March 30th. And so he talks a little bit more about the story and them in the camp. But he says, you know, it was so interesting that as they got closer to this date, I mean, he, he left from this dream and left from this 
fairy tale voice that came out of nowhere with all of this hope that maybe it was so vivid, it was so real, that maybe it, maybe it was just true. And as they got closer to March, and as they got middle way through March, it was clear that nothing was getting better. And, and they there weren't even close. Unless something was going to happen all of a sudden, they weren't even close to being done with the war. There was no hint that they were going to get out of this predicament. And it was honestly it looked worse. Like, you know this is going to end poorly for you. And then, sure enough, true story, he says on March 29th, this man got um, incredibly ill. Incredibly ill. With typhus. On the 30th, he became del delusional and lost consciousness. And on the 31st, he died. It's an unbelievable thing. And he says, everybody would look at him and say, on the outward appearances, you would be like, well, this man died of typhus. It was, but everybody that was close to him and everybody that was a friend of his said that we knew that, yes, while it was typhus, it was something that he probably could have pulled through. It was something that he could have made it through. But they said it was just something about losing hope that you had no ability to fight. You had no ability to go on anymore. That it really does even affect your circumstances, even physically. And he says, we just knew that that lack of hope was something that crushed him and there was no more life for him to be had. And, and I look at that and I think this is the sentiment that Peter has for us. It's the sentiment that he began to write about here as he starts even in verse 3. He's talking and reminding these people who are exiles, literally, physically. They have no home. They have no permanence. They have no provision. They are away from home. They are experiencing persecution. They are experiencing experiencing tests they are experiencing trials it is physical it is because of their verbal witness in jesus christ and he is starting with this idea he's giving them hope but here's the difference it's not in a fairy tale voice that's what he said we can put our hope all of us right now have all of these things while we're not literal exiles right now we have just what we talked about last time there are trials there are testing and God, we talked about last time, allows those things in his sovereignty to happen. And here we are with our first strange thing. Peter's saying we ought to have hope. We ought to have joy in those things because they are just temporary. Our hope is not here. And so here's what he's reminding us is that while we could put our hope in almost anything else, we could put it in money. We could put it in our bank account. We could put it in a fairy tale voice that talks to us. We could put it in another person or ourselves. Here's what he's saying. Those things are temporary. But here's what he's saying. We have a living hope that is permanent. And it is fixed. This is what he begins to say here at the beginning of, of chapter 1. He says it is something that is kept in heaven for you. It is guarded. We have a savior and a salvation, an inheritance that is undefiled. It is not going to be tainted. It is unfading. And he says this is what we put our hope in. And so what he begins with this letter is in saying in the midst of these sufferings, in the midst of cancer, in the midst of heart troubles, in the midst of anxieties about the future in the midst of financial difficulty in the midst of political upheaval in the midst of whatever the trial is that God is allowing in your life here's what we do first we put our focus we put our attention we put our perspective we put our eyesight we take our outlook and place it upon Jesus because we know that where our outlook is is going to impact our outcome that what we behold is what we will become. Who I surround myself and what I look at will impact what I do. This is what he's saying. And, and specifically, he's given us that instruction that what we behold is what we will become. And our outlook will impact our outcome. And he's saying that in the vein of struggle and trial and suffering and testing. He's saying if we can do that, he says that it's possible for us to be the weirdos who in the midst of being grieved by these various trials and having our faith tested to see if it's genuine or not can absolutely do what we see in verse 6, that we can be people who rejoice in that. Because we know that God is using it for a purpose. That's what we learned last time. That God uses this testing and trial. It's not wasted. Number one, it's temporary. It's not going to last forever. It lasts for a little while. And even if that's all of our earthly life, it's a little while compared to eternity, what we have fixed our eyes on. And not only is it a little while, and not only is it temporary, it is producing for us an eternal weight of glory. That God is allowing it to happen to uh, grow us spiritually, we learn that. That God absolutely shows us that suffering, Romans tells us that suffering produces patience, and patience produces endurance. Endurance gives us hope. We see that it also stops us. Maybe it's something in our life where God, because he's a father who loves us, he reminds us that we ought not 
reject that. He's a father that loves us, so he disciplines us. He stops us from doing things that are destructive. It's not just slapping our wrist because we've done something bad. That's not why I slap uh, and, and punish and discipline my children. I, I do it because I love them, because I don't want to see them continue on doing something that they're going to destroy themselves and be destructive. This is why God allows things to happen. We learned last week that sometimes he comes in your life when it doesn't look like anything's going on in your life. He looks at your life like Job and says, you know, sometimes we just want to shake that bottle up to see if there's anything in there. Let's shake it up and see what happens. Let's see what a little bit of trial will do. Let's see what a little bit of testing will do. And see if there's anything there. We learn that. Sometimes it's not disobedience for the shaking. I mean, we saw in Hebrews that the author of Hebrews says that suffering is what caused even Jesus to learn obedience. It wasn't that Jesus needed to learn obedience because he was disobedient. It made the obedience that he had even richer and broader. It perfected some of that uh, work in his life. And so here he starts by reminding us the whole outcome and the whole thesis of this book for us to be strange people are is that in everything we do and specifically with trial and testing and hard times is that we set our hope on Jesus and the salvation we have in him, the grace that we've experienced in him. And this is where we now find ourselves here. So I want to read from verses 13 through 21 now he starts to put the rubber to the road. He says, let's get practical here. And so now, having said all of that, he starts with the therefore. Therefore, in verse 13, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. That's Leviticus in a number of places. Verse 17, and if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deed, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He has foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. There is a lot in that. And here's what I want to do for this time. I really kind of just want to focus on really verses 13 through kind of 17 here. And here's what we begin to see. What do we do? So we, we know the review. We know what Peter's trying to accomplish here. We know what he's trying to remind us to keep our vision on. Now that we've gotten all of the, our perspectives and we've gotten the lecture about what we're supposed to be focused on, now he's trying to say, okay, now here's how you go live this. Here's how this is supposed to actually go and look. Here's how this is actually going to be accomplished. He didn't just end the letter here and say, hey, focus on Jesus, people. Focus on Jesus. Set your hope on the glory that's coming before you. Just go do it. I think that people could legitimately look at him and be like, yeah, how? how? How do we do that on a daily basis? Do, do I just snap my finger and go from, man, I'm afraid and I'm fearful to, oh yeah, let me just put my, you know, let me get all the distractions out of it and put it on him. What will that look like? And that's what he begins to do. And so look at verse 13. This is where the rubber starts meeting the road. It's interesting here because I want you to notice something. In the first 12 verses, oh, by the way, which a uh, little fun fact Bible thing, which is all one sentence, by the way. For, first 12 verses, one, that's an amazing run-on sentence we got going on here with Peter, but it is all one sentence. And in that first long 12 verses, one sentence, there are no commands yet. There have been no imperatives. There's nothing in this that he has told them to do yet. This is where he's about to say, hey, okay, now we know what we're supposed to focus on. Now here are some things that we're supposed to do in order to see that happen in our lives. And he starts right here. He says three things right off the box in verse 13. He says, therefore, preparing your minds for action. So prepare your minds. Be sober-minded. And the ultimate thing he's reiterating that we ought to be doing is set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I love this. What, was, what must we do to continually keep our focus and our hope? Here's what he says. We ought to prepare your minds for action. 
you look at this, there's this idea, every single commentary will tell you that you look at the words of verse 13 and the, the language there is something we're not familiar with. He says that what we ought to do, this idea of preparing our minds for action is this idea of girding up the loins of our minds. That's the literal translation of this. When you hear the word girding up your loins, anybody ever heard the phrase gird your loins? It's a, it's a weird, we don't uh, use language like that. And I think even when we use language like that in phrases, we're not even sure what that means and where it came from. Anybody want to take, I mean, if you've heard that before, you know what that means. What did it mean to gird up your loins in ancient language? Exactly. Give it a shot. I guess like if you're getting ready to run. Yes. Yes. We don't uh, have this problem today. I don't. Maybe some ladies have in the past, but if you were to go back to Peter's day and if you were a man, you would have had clothes on that were not jeans. And it wasn't a polo shirt, and you wouldn't have been wearing sneakers. You would have had long clothes on. You would have had essentially like a sheet and dress, and it would have been robes. And, and you went everywhere slow. You weren't running around in that. But if you needed to get somewhere fast, if you needed to get somewhere expeditiously, basically what you would do is that you would, in this ancient Oriental custom, is that you would take one of your long robes, you would pull it up, essentially, wrap it through your legs, and tie it into your belt for lack of a better word you would tie it up so that you could run so that you could get somewhere faster than you're going you would tie it around your waist. you would prepare for running walking or any kind of other strenuous activity it would be like the 2019 version of saying here's what we do we are going to roll up our sleeves girding your loins of your minds is like saying let's roll up our sleeves and get to work here's what peter says this is not going to be hard i mean this is not going to be easy this kind of a thing, while it's easy to write this letter to people, hey, you're getting your heads chopped off and you're suffering and there's hard times. It would be like me looking at somebody and saying, hey, look, I know your mind is being distracted right now because they just told you you've got stage three or stage four cancer, but set your mind on Jesus. Don't look at that seen thing that's going on with all these x-rays. Keep your mind focused on the unseen things. And they'd be like, oh, well, I'm glad you told me that. That's just a piece of cake. I'll do that. He says, no, no, no. I know that that is the truth. Paul, Paul said it. Peter said it. We want to look not to the seen, but to the unseen. He, he gives us these ridiculous commands like we ought to be joyful in that. And I think we would look at him and say, well, this is not an easy thing. He's like, it's not. Here's the first thing he tells us to do. If this is going to really happen, if we're going to be in the place where no matter what happens in this life, we're able to have joy, he says, I want you to know right now, you better roll up your sleeves because this is going to be hard work. And you've got to do some intentional work to make this kind of a thing happen. And here's the intentional work he begins to give us an idea. He says we ought to prepare our minds. If we're going to have a, a, an opportunity, if we're ever going to have a chance of glorifying God by living in a manner that endures struggle, endures this life, endures this goldsmith's fire that we saw at the end of the last section that we covered, all of this life is an oven fire of testing. He is testing, testing the genuineness of our faith. That's what all of this life is. There will never be a moment on this earth where a Christian is not in the fire. You're in it every day. It might be not as hot some days, and it may be just burning unbearable heart, heart. Like we said last time, the weight some days may be like soggy clothes, but the weight of these testing and trials might be like an anvil some days. That is all of this life. And if we're going to have any chance of making it through that kind of a struggle of testing and trials, then it's going to require that we keep our focus on Christ and the inheritance that we have in Him and what is to come for us. And so He is telling us this, if our hearts hope when we talk about hope, it's something that you associate with your heart. If your heart is going to be consumed with Christ and your hope is going to be in Him, then here's what you're going to have to address. Your minds are also going to have to be consumed. Let me give you another way to think about this, a little modern translation of, I think, what he begins to say in verse 13 here. You're going to have to begin to clear away anything from your thinking and anything from your mind that hinders you from being able to put your thoughts on work for God. Prepare your minds. Gird up the loins of your mind. Is there anything dangling around the ankles of your mind that is going to slow you down from doing what I'm telling you you're going to need to do? So he says, in order for our hearts to be consumed at such a place that I'm going to be so consumed with my hope in my heart 
for what I have in Christ Jesus. He says, let's start with this. We're going to come back to that recipe in a minute. But he, he kind of elaborated on a little bit more. He says, not only should we be what? In verse, he says, we should be praying, preparing our minds for action and being sober-minded. Let me just put that in uh, terms that, for me, I, I like to break things down as simple as I can get it because that's how I think. Avoid having drunken minds is the best way I can think about it. Let's have sober-mindedness. It means when I get the picture of somebody who is not sober, they are drunk. They are stumbling around. They don't think clearly. They are uh, not... When you don't think clearly, when you're drunk, you don't make good decisions. You don't... You, do, you hurt yourself. You don't remember things. The same thing can happen here mentally. He's putting this with attention to our mind. Here's what he's saying. That we ought not have drunken minds. We ought to be mentally alert. We ought to be mentally self-controlled. And we ought to be mentally disciplined with, us, with our attention spans. Here's what he's telling us. He says, in the midst of trial, here's what I'm going to tell you to do. You need to start working and thinking about your mind. We're going to see more about this in Scripture. He says, we need to be prepared for action. In order for us to have this hope where it's really going to last, it's not a matter of me just sitting here and thinking, if I sit on the couch in the middle of all these struggles, yeah, this is just, I'm, I'm going to have joy. I'm gonna, my heart is going to have joy. No, he says, it starts with your mind is going to affect what's in your heart. And he says, in order for that to happen, we need to prepare ourselves. I need my mind not to be divided. I need for it not to be confused. I need for it not to be hindered by other things in the world that will stop me from placing it upon Christ. And I need for it not to be drunken and influenced by this world either. And here's what he says. Basically, he looks at people in the midst of your struggle, in the midst of your suffering and the testing and the trial. I need you to get a grip mentally. I need for you. I know things are tough. I know things are hard. I need you to think clearly. Let me tell you what happens to a lot of people, and Christians are people, when things go bad. We have a tendency when we are away from the Lord, and when we say away from the Lord, we are not in the Word. We're going to hear how the Word applies to all of this. We already have. When I'm not in the Word, when I'm not reminding myself of the promises of God, when I am not growing in my relationship with Him, I mean, we're, this is the, the key to everything. When, when I'm not in the Word, then my faith is, is shifting sand. And the Word says, Paul said it, Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Faith doesn't come by any other means. I, I know Jesus more every single time I open the Word and, and He grows my faith because I'm now renewed in the promises. I know what they are. It has a way of just rearranging furniture inside and separating joints from ligament. I grow my faith. I know him more. I'm, it's the daily bread that I have. He, Ephesians 6 says it's the sword that I have to fight off the lies of the enemy because he's giving me truth. And here's what I know when I begin to look at this. I, I am closer. I understand. I'm able to see him when he tells us to look at it. Here's what I know. When you're not in the word, here's what you are. And this is what a friend told me one time and it stuck with me for the rest of my life. When you're not in the word, you're two things. You're dead meat that's what you are you are a sitting duck for the enemy and so when testing comes of course i'm going to look to the scene i don't have any faith you know what it takes in order for me to look at things that are not there you know what it takes to do what peter's trying to do right now set our hope on what is to come i have never seen what is to come i, I haven't been there yet I'm not Paul who got a vision of the third heaven. I have not seen Jesus face to face. I have not. I have not heard him audibly. Everything that I'm putting my hope in that is permanent and fixed requires faith because I have never, I've never seen it with my own eyes. But that's what faith is. I mean, that's what we learn from Scripture. It's what we learn from Romans. It's what we learn from Hebrews. That faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's the substance of things. I mean, uh, uh, it's the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. So when he tells us to look to the unseen, he tells us to look to our inheritance. The only way that's going to happen is if you have faith. And if you don't have faith, if you are not abiding in his word and you're not abiding in Christ, you have no choice but to put your hope in things that are seen. And when you put your hope in things that are seen and testing comes and trials come and suffering comes and the heat turns up in your life, here's what you do. Mentally, you freak out. You freak out. You take somebody who is walking with the Lord and look, you can be grieved and you can be upset and you can get anxious, but a person who has faith says, you know what, I know, that's bad news. That's bad news. Stage four cancer is terrible. I'm going to pray against this. I'm, I'm not happy about it. But you know what? It doesn't do anything for my joy. 
Um, I, I, it doesn't change anything about my treasure and my inheritance and my crown and where I'm going. This isn't my home. We all have an appointed time. I'm praying through this, but I'm not in the depths of despair. I have my eyes firmly set on Christ Jesus. He's real. My faith in Him is real. I'm looking to those things that are unseen. You let somebody who's not in there get the exact same news and they freak out. They go to Google because that's their hope. I'm speaking from experience here. I can look back at my own life and say, boy, it was a measure of where my faith was. Somebody comes, I, I go into the doctor's office and I think I have a ringworm. I'm not even prepared for this. I had a little spot on my cheek and I'm thinking what is this maybe they'll tell me it's a ringworm give me a cream and I'm out of here and he looks at me and says Brad you, you have stage 3 cancer and the next day they're cutting tumors out of my leg and I've got a tumor on my kidney and my liver and my duodenum and I'm thinking this ain't good I've got a two week girl at home and they're telling me 80% chance you're not around in four years and I'm thinking that's messed up that's messed up and you know what I do it's the worst thing ever I open the laptop and I'm like let's google this thing it was a mistake it's a mistake. You start reading everything and self-diagnosing and I'm a doctor all of a sudden and I had moments where I was like, oh my gosh, what are they going to do? Who's going to raise them? How are they going to make freak out moment? You know what he begins to tell us? He says, look, you got to start addressing your mind in order for this to really happen. You, you can't just say, boy, I want my heart to be in this place where it is just totally has faith and it's relying upon him and I'm going to set my hope fully on the hope that we have in Christ Jesus without addressing my mind. He says we, we will have a tendency without faith in him, without abiding in him to freak out and exaggerate things. We will make even the things that are happening in our life worse, worse in our minds. We do that. Let me tell you what, 75% of the things that I freaked out about in my life and I was anxious about never even happened. When he tells us we ought not worry, I think even on a practical, I think most of us, that would be our story. If I could go back and think, gosh, I've spent a lot of time worrying about that, you know what, it all worked out. You look back every time and you're like, you know, he told us that too. You know, he told us that. Paul told us that in Romans 8, 28. All things work together for the good of those who are called according to his purpose. And you're thinking, yeah, that's true. Routinely, I will get before the Lord in prayer and say, God, please make me a person who really believes Romans 8, 28. If we really believe Romans 8, 28... What would we freak out about? But it takes faith to believe that. You know, John Piper told a story one time about losing his wallet. He says, you know, four times in my life I've lost my wallet, and three out of those four times I freaked out. Lost my wallet, and you freak out because then you start dreaming up stuff in your mind. You're like, somebody is buying something right now from Best Buy, and they're draining my bank account, and my Social Security number just got hijacked and everything else. And he says, you know, after each one of those times, he freaked out. It all worked out. He didn't. He still had money. It was all good. He says, but the fourth time he lost his wallet, and it was different. For three, four days, he had lost his wallet and didn't freak out a bit. He was on vacation, still enjoyed time on the beach. It didn't ruin his life. It didn't ruin his vacation. And, and you get to the end of hearing him tell this story, and you're thinking, man, what was the difference? What was the difference? He says, the difference is I didn't know I lost it the last time. He said, somewhere on vacation, I lost my wallet, never knew it the whole time. He said, when I discovered it, as I got home and somebody mailed it to me, I went to the mailbox, I was like, oh my gosh. He's like, I haven't had this wallet for four days, I didn't even know it. And he says, but you know, God used that. The same thing happened. Everything worked out just fine like it did the other three times, except for this time, the only difference was he didn't waste three days of his life worrying about it. And he says, if we were people that really believe Romans 8, 28, no matter what test you're going through, you know this. You know who God is. You know that he loves you. You know that he's working all things together for good. You know that even these things that are happening right here are going to make you better spiritually. They're going to produce perseverance. They're going to make you more patient. They're going to stop you from doing something that's destructive. It's going to only enrich things in your life. He says, if we really believe Romans 8, 28, that even when you're waiting on an answer, it's on its way. We ought to have joy. Don't freak out. But you know what? It takes faith. It, make, it takes us opening the word, using our minds, reminding ourselves of who he is. Don't freak out. Our minds scream at us so loud in the midst of testing and trial that we lose and we're distracted from doing the very thing Peter's trying to tell us to do. We can't focus on Christ, man, because I got Google shouting at me and my own mind shouting at me and there's arguments in our household because we're worried about money and we're arguing and life gets so noisy, it drowns out Christ. And he says, you know where you start? In order to affect your heart and have hope, you better put some blinders on to some of that junk and you better 
What did he say here? You better prepare your minds in order to act. And you better be sober-minded. He says, calm yourself down. I get the idea of a Peter who would be, look at somebody freaking out. They just told me I got cancer. And it's like one of those old school movies where they grab you around the neck and slap you. And you're like, whew, throw a glass of water in your face. He said, this is what I'm talking about. Putting our hope in Christ Jesus, he begins to say, this is the first step for us to actually see this happen. Because what he says is here at this life, he says, we want to put our attention and our hope upon the grace that we have in Christ Jesus. We are only in this life. Let me just take a moment and talk about this grace. We are only at the beginning of grace here. I know that sounds odd. We, what we have experienced of grace in Jesus Christ at this point will not compare to the grace we will experience when Christ comes or we are standing in front of him face to face. It's true. And so here you have Peter and he's telling us with our minds, we need to have a long view, not a short view of our relationship with Christ. It's not a get out of hell free card. It's not like salvation is the end line. Salvation at the point you come to know Jesus is the, the beginning. It's the starting line, not the end point. That's why we talk about discipleship. You know, even when I was in seminary, this is some two decades ago, nobody ever used that word. I don't know. It wasn't in the lingo. I don't get it. We never heard the word disciple 20 years ago. Even I'm working on a a master's degree in theology. It was evangelism. I heard a lot about evangelism, which is important, but never discipleship. It was, we got to get people saved. I want them to not go to hell, which is a wonderful thing, but that is not the end. I think for a, a whole period of the church's life, we would try to get people saved and then after they said yes or said a prayer we just left you to the wolves left you to the to the wolves and here's what we learned we want to have a long view in order for us to do what peter's saying i got to realize this yes i have been saved not only have i been saved i am being saved every single day and i will be saved that's the idea when we talk about salvation yes i've been saved for my sin And it's awaiting me. But every single day, you know what is happening today? Jesus literally has sin in my life today and it is being uh, covered and overcome by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. And there will be a day in actuality where I stand before him and even the effects of this sin in my physical body will be, I'll be rescued from that. What a wonderful, wonderful thing. We focus on this idea. We focus on the long view of grace. It wasn't just that all of these things are going to happen. Now they're going to happen. Our outlook determines our outcome. So in trials, in testing, in suffering, we prepare our minds. We remain sober-minded, and it will allow us to set our hope on the unseen. It will allow us to help, help us keep our focus on glory, on heaven, on salvation, on, on grace. It allows us to have optimism in the midst of darkness. I love it. Warren Wiersbe was saying just what we learned last week. He says it will allow us to see even our trials and as things that we can rejoice in. He says this, you know, it's it's only possible to see the stars if there is darkness. You know, you don't see them in the daytime, but you see the brilliance of the stars are best seen when it's dark. I think of Ragley when I think of that. I miss Ragley for so many reasons. There's no stoplights, no stop signs, there's no businesses. It's 80% rice fields and pine trees, and people would think, you're nuts. I'm thinking, it sounds like heaven to me. It sounds like heaven to me, but I remember I used to go back on our back 40. We had 70 acres, and I would lay down just in the grass or on our trampoline back there, and I would look at the sky, and let me tell you what, the stars are brighter in Ragley than they are here in the city. Amen. Just way brighter, because it is way darker where I live, man. You, you go somewhere without a flashlight, you're in, you got problems. You got problems in Ragley. It is crazy dark. But you, it seems like you could see everything in all of the solar system in Ragley. And I could lay there for hours and be like, this is crazy. I remember the first time I took Emily home, I, I, I brought her back there. This is my idea of a cool date. I was like, let's get on the tractor. And I loaded this city girl up and put her on the side of the tractor, rode her to the back 40, and then I waited for it to get dark, and we laid on the trampoline, and I was like, just watch watch this it's gonna be awesome and uh it must have worked because we're married today so <laughs> but that's this life we we lay on the trampoline of this life and it, it will get dark it will be dark and and there will be days where you you can't see your hand in front of your face but i'm gonna tell you what we keep our eyes focused 
I keep my eyes focused on the brilliance of his glory and what awaits us. And it's not a fairy tale. It's not a dream. It's real. It's real. And that, that will keep you going. It will become something, even in the midst of the darkness, something that you will say, this is beautiful. This is beautiful. And then there will be a day. What we're keeping our focus on is literally, we know when we read scripture that there will be a day where there is no more darkness. I mean, when I get to this inheritance, there, there will only be light. Only be light coming from the throne. So that's incredible. So the first thing we do is we begin to prepare our minds. And when we do that, that happens in the word, oh, by the way. It's not like I just sit down. What do I focus on? I'm preparing my mind for action is and I'm disciplining myself with the word. And then he goes on. Look in verse 14. We get our second imperative. He says, as obedient children. I'm going to come back to that. I love that he gave the analogy of a father with a child. And obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Here's the second thing we're supposed to do. Oh, by the way, this is something that makes us strange here. So here's our really strange thing number two about Christians. We ought to live holy lives. What does holy mean? We throw that around a lot at church. We hear the word holiness and holy. What does it mean to be holy? Set apart. Set apart. Anybody else want to throw another word come to your mind with holy? That's true. Sanctified, set apart, separated. Some, you know, literally, the word means to cut and separate something out. Different, I think would be an appropriate word for holiness. Totally different. We look at this, and, and here's what we know. We are called to be separate, set apart, cut away from everything else. We are called to be uh, different and sanctified, removed from this world this is what we're supposed to do and specifically here he's talking with regard to sin he's saying that we ought to live holy lives it means if this is sin and this is the way I used to live and I've been set free from that because of this inheritance this salvation I've been saved from what I've been saved from sin I've been saved from the wrath of God and the judgment that comes because of my sin now that I've been set free from that I literally scripture says that I'm a new being I'm a new creature who's been born again I think that's what you know we we, we hear uh, you know, people asking Jesus, how can a man be born again? I, because this is what happens to you. You're totally different. It's no longer you who live. It's Christ who lives in you. If that's the case, then you ought to live this way. You ought to step out of that and say, you know what? you got new clothes now, it says. You're a new being. Literally, we see that in Colossians. We see this idea of taking off these old garments and putting on new garments. He's saying, live like this. Live like what you are. And that's the process of sanctification. We know that. It's like a butterfly. You know, a butterfly starts off as what? A caterpillar. You know what's interesting about a caterpillar and a butterfly? You cut them and look at a cross-section of their DNA. There is literally no difference to that. I mean, it would look exactly the same. The caterpillar is just in the process of becoming what it already is. That's what he's asking us to do here. It's in the process of becoming what it already is. I am saved. And what I'm doing in this fire right now is I am being set apart. I ought to be in this continual process of walking away from this. I ought to be in this process. You know, salvation, this inheritance that we have, is not a, uh, a prayer. It's not just a, uh, uh, a transcript. It's not something that I say. It is transformation. All of this life is me being saved here. I'm being saved. I'm walking away from sin. It ought to be something that's dying. You know, we see that imagery in Scripture. Salvation is me, what? Dying to my old self. And here's what we're called to do. To do that. I'm setting my mind on what? I'm setting my mind, abiding in the Word, knowing Jesus more, and the, for the purpose is to become like Him. That's what we are, Christ followers. We are called here to live holy lives. And let me just tell you something. That is something that is only possible, truly possible, for believers in Jesus Christ. If God is not your father, living a holy life will be impossible because holy conduct that's pleasing to God is the fruit of being a member of his family. That's why he says, as obedient children here. We simply don't possess the power to do sing, to do this with our own genes and our own heritage. It's why in verse 18 he says, you were, here's what you were. You used to be ransomed to the feudal ways that you inherited from your forefathers. From your earthly fathers, you were children. Let me tell you something about children. They routinely 
become like their parents. It happens. Maybe not all the time, but that happens a lot. Even when you're trying for it not to happen, somehow it happens sometimes. You say things. I look in the mirror routinely and I'm like, gosh, that, that looked like Jarrett Kirby, my dad. Or I'll say something and think, boy, that reminded me of my dad. And most of the time I'm like, I'm okay with that. Sometimes you're like, oh, you know, oh. Well, look at Luke. We had this conversation with me and Emily the other day. Luke loves everything I love. And I didn't tell him to. He's never been to an LSU football game in his whole life. Never. He wasn't even born in Louisiana. He was born in Texas. He loves LSU football. And there's only one reason why. Because his dad loves LSU football. I've indoctrinated him. It's impossible for him to love anything else. His grandfather loves Auburn. I told his grandfather, don't buy it. He ain't going to wear it. And we'll just throw it right in the garbage. He... You ask this kid, he loves Star Wars. Why does he love Star Wars? Because his dad loves Star Wars. Why does he uh, play football and he loves sports? Because his dad loves these things. Why does he like racing? Because his dad loves these things. And, and I would look at it and be like, it's amazing. He will end up growing up and it's almost like it's not even a choice. I mean, sadly, it's not even a choice. He will end up liking these things not because I'm telling you gotta like it maybe other than the LSU thing you you I'm not I'm not telling him you gotta like these things he just does because he he wants to be like his dad and that's what we were before even Jesus Christ we we were children who were doing and we're inundated with what our forefathers were sin this is all we know we can't break free from it I'm even he says we're ignorant in our ignorance I don't even know that there is anything other than sin it's all this world I didn't even know he says, but now he took us as obedient children and he tells us this. He says, now you have a different father. You now have a different forefather. And now it's not sin that characterizes you. He, he, I look at like a prison cell. It's like a sitting in a prison cell and it's completely dark and there is a key out there, but I'm ignorant of it because I don't know it's there. It's dark. I don't have the light. I don't even know the key's there. Jesus comes and he shines a light on the key. He is the key. He opens the prison doors and we come walking out. But what he's trying to tell us in the midst of our trials and our temptations is I think a lot of times that we will just want to return back to the prison cell and go sit in there. It's not our home. I'm not bound to this place anymore, but we want to go back to living in this city. We want to put the shackles back on. We want, to, we want to put the prison uniform back on. And he's like, this is silly. This is not your home. This is not who you are. You've been set free. Walk out of this garbage. I know I've said this before on a Sunday morning. It's like the idea of these elephants at the circus. You know, when they're little baby elephants, they shackle them up around one leg because you don't put elephants in cages. But you have to keep them in captivity. And they'll put these shackles around their legs, nail this spike in the ground three or four feet, and they just walk around. I mean, their whole life is just a big circle that they trod in the ground until there's no more grass. And at some point, you know, the thing is, like any other living thing, they grow. They get bigger, they get bigger, they get bigger, they get bigger. And, and you still can't put them in a cage. What do they do? The same thing. It's the same chain, the same depth in the ground. But now this animal is, I don't know how many tons it is. The truth is, it could break free from this thing anytime it wanted to. It didn't know it can been trained it's been trained where has it been trained right here it's not real i mean if that elephant ever could in its mind realize if it could see that this is not something that could hold them any longer it, like a toothpick is that little thing you look at an elephant if it wanted to it would break that thing and be like i'm out of here i'm gone but what do they do they keep walking this little path just keep walking it shackled in there the shackle isn't even doing anything but they have trained themselves to walk this way. We've got to prepare our minds for action. Train ourselves. You know what we do when we train ourselves? We preach the gospel to ourselves over and over and over because it's not a one-time thing. I ought to get in the Word, every bit of the Word, even the Old Testament. I don't care, I don't care what pastor's out there today telling you that it is, we ought not read it anymore. That's a joke and it's sinful. Jesus quoted the Old Testament more than almost anybody I know. And he even told him after the resurrected Jesus was sitting on a beach talking to his disciples before he left, he went back and what did he do? He showed them how in all of the Old Testament, how all of it pointed to him. From the beginning of the Bible, from Genesis to the back of where you have the maps, all of it is talking about Jesus. It is all the gospel. And when I say abide in the word and abide in Christ, here's what I'm doing. I'm preaching the gospel to myself every day because I will forget it. I will forget who I am. The more I understand the great I am, the more I will understand who I am. I will remind myself that I'm not 
a person who's now characterized by sin. My nature is not sin. My destination is not hell. I am not a person who has no hope. I will remind myself of the gospel that I am a child of the sovereign king over all of creation. That I am co-heirs with Christ. That seems wrong to me, but it's what the Bible says, so it has to be true. Co-heirs with Jesus. I will remind myself that I am a royal priesthood is what the Bible says. That I am a chosen people. I will remind myself that there is a home that is being guarded for me. I will remind myself that the spirit of the living God dwells in me and that I ought not have a spirit of fear or timidity but one of power and self-control. All of these things are true. But let me tell you something. When I'm not in the word and I close it, I may not know it. It doesn't make it any less true, but we become elephants who don't know any better. We walk around the little path of sin and we continue to freak out. We continue to do things we shouldn't do. We continue to have despair and not hope. And the only difference is, it's not that we're not saved. It's not that we're not children of God. And no, it's just that I haven't prepared my mind for action. I don't know. I don't know. So I'll freak out and I'll continue to walk this path right here. He says, no, if we're going to have any chance of making it through these trials, abide in the word and remind yourself of who you are in Christ Jesus. Put your mind fully on the hope that awaits us. What in a resurrected Jesus? Live holy lives is what he says as a result of this. So you see this positive command here and it also has a negative command with it. If we are going to live holy lives, number one, let me just back up a little bit. I think some people would get really confused with this. We are to live holy lives. We're to be holy as who's holy? He is, he is holy. That seems wrong to me in a little bit. There would be a part if we're just going to read this for what's on the paper and forget all the church language. God is holy. That means this. God is different. He's sanctified. He's separated. He's not sinful. I mean, we would, we would look at this and say God is holy. It means from, from he is different than every other person that's ever existed. Agreed? He is, let me word it like this. If I drew a circle right now and I put everything that's ever been created, that's everything, right? And we put it in the middle of that circle. There's only one being that's not in the circle. God. That's God. That's amazing to me. Everything else, everything is in that circle except for God. That is, you can't get any more holy than that. That's max holiness right there. Sin, good, people, this coffee, my shirt, the water, Star Wars shoes, this chair, all of it in the circle. God stands outside. So he is holy. He is separate from everything, everyone. He alone. He's the only one who is the creator. He is outside of the creation. He is separate and sanctified and holy in all of his deeds, in all of his character, in his nature. That means he is the first. He's the last. He's greater than everything. In him there is no shifting shadow there is no darkness there is no sin and here we see peter saying yeah be holy because he's holy does that mean that we're going to be holy just like he's holy because i think people would read that and be like well that's impossible is that what he's trying to tell us here is that what that means no look at what he means here look at what he means here look at verses 14 and 15 as obedient children how is that supposed to look for us does that mean that i'm now exactly going to be like god no here's the nature in which he says we ought to be holy that as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Don't be like the one you used to be, ignorant in the cell. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy. How? In all of your conduct. Of course, in my nature right now, I'm not going to be holy. My nature is sinful right now. <laughs> what is your nature? Let me just say this so we know. I'm not, I'm not confusing people with language. I have to ask you, what, what's the nature of a cat? But literally, just bio, biologically, what's the nature of a cat? What is it? A cat. A cat. It's an animal. It's a feline. The nature of a dog is a canine. The nature of Brad is a human. What's the nature of God? You can even get more specific than that. He's father, son, and spirit. That's different. I can only ever be one thing. His nature is different. Brad, I, I will always be. You know what? I'll be here in this flesh right now on this earth. I'm flesh. One thing, that's my nature. And in this flesh right now, bound up in this bundle of dirt, essentially is what it is, is sin. It's sin here. That's what Paul said. I'm battling my flesh, my spirit. It's been forgiven. I'm in the process of putting this flesh and this sinful nature to death. Here's what he begins to tell us. That I'm, not, I'm obviously not going to be holy in my nature. My nature right now as a human being is sinful. 
my character, guess what? There are times where I still sin. Yes, I know that's not hard for anybody to believe. You hang around me long enough, guess what? I'm no different than anybody else here and everybody else in the world. Sin, it is inevitable here. It's like Augustine. He, he, he learned that there are some things that are inevitable. And you know, it started with, he's like, I can't stop sin. I can try all I want to. Can't stop it at all. And here's what I learned is that I, that's not me saying I got to be like God in those ways. No, he makes it clear. We are supposed to be living holy lives in our conduct. So here's the positive command. Live holy lives. And here's how we do that. He gives us a negative command. That I not be conformed to the passions of my former ignorance. You know what it means? It means that I ought to separate myself from sinful behavior as much as I possibly can. Uh, get away from a lifestyle that used to be my existence. That I ought to sprint from it, run from it, kill it, stab it, knock it out. Whatever I got to do, I got to get out of this. And what did he say? Maybe, maybe you don't think of it as a prison cell. Look at the words here used. I didn't even think of this. As obedient children, do not be what? Conformed. Get out of that mold. That's not your mold anymore. You, you are not supposed to be in this container of the world anymore get out of the cell do not be conformed get out of the form get out of the mold the opposite of conformity here's how you can look at this the opposite of conformity is holiness be like your new father i'm trying to find ways to say this that's why he called them children you once were children of your old fathers now look at this language as obedient children children of god be like your New father. I'm going to get the privilege to baptize my son on Sunday. Thank you, it's amazing. It's amazing. That's a whole story I could tell you. You know, a year ago, he would look at us in the bathtub. He's always been a really honest kid, and he would be frustrated because his dad's preaching the gospel to him every single day. And he would look at me. He's like, Dad, I mean, frustrated. He'd say, I can't. Literally verbatim, the words are, I can't believe in Jesus. Like, almost like, stop telling me about him. I'm like, why? He's like, I can't see him. This is like the tooth fairy. I can't believe in him. And that is not who he is today at all. It's amazing work where only, you know, I wish I could program him like little robots and make him do things, but I can. I mean, you look at him today, and man, it's not a question. He, he, he knows the Lord. It's something in his life. But I will get this privilege to baptize my son. And, and the weird and glorious thing is, is that when I, not when I dunk him, it would just be a symbol of what's already happened, is that he has a new father, a new Amen. father, Amen. much better than his earthly father, much better. When I, when I get to dunk them under that water what it symbolizes is that we are family but we are brothers Amen. we're brothers we're brothers because of what jesus does and i want him to be not like his dad that's the truth and my goal is for him to be like his heavenly father and that is accomplished in christ jesus and he says we are to we are to live holy lives here's what he's saying we ought to prepare our minds for action and that action is what i want to end with the action is we ought to be in the business of trying to kill sin mortify your sin put it to death is what scripture says we ought to mean the business of finding sin in our life identifying it and, and murdering it in our lives i mean we see all kind of scripture for like this if your arm and you know your hands offending you psh, let's lop that thing off if you've got an offensive eye let's pluck that thing out we are killing sin you know i read a story about a gentleman true story who had a pet python something wrong with you if that's you, I'm sorry. Snakes, it's biblical. They're evil. It's not right. I don't like snakes. I don't want it on me. I don't like seeing videos of snakes. This brother had a snake. He had a pet python, and literally, we keep it on him. It was his pet. He cuddled with this thing. It ended up slowly one day. I guess it just was tired of him. It choked him out. It killed him. His pet python that he had raised and they got incredibly large and big killed this man. And I think of that python and here's what we learn about sin. Even though we, we're in the word, we know that our nature is we're going to be in this battle of struggling with it. We're in this process of trying to separate ourselves from it. And he's given us all the tools to do that. He's given us his spirit. He's given us his word. And he's asked us because we're now his children and we've got these tools. He's asked us to use the tools and kill the sin. And here's the reason why, not just because it will help us have a bigger view, is because sin is the very thing that will stop us from doing that. It is destructive. I hope, I hope you know that. Sin is worse than we make it out to be. We talk about sin like it's little boo-boos, and, you know, I had a little sin here. No, it's a killer. 
If you cuddle up with it, it will choke you out gradually or sometimes suddenly. It will kill you. John Owen used to have the famous phrase. Anybody ever heard? You knew John Owen? You ever heard the phrase, be killing sin or it will be killing you? He was right. That's what John Owen used to always say. That was his bumper sticker statement. Be killing sin or it will be killing you. So what does it mean for us to be holy? It means that, and we're going to talk about how this is done in a minute, it means that I am in the process of killing sin, using the gift of the spirit that's been placed in me, using, growing my faith in the word. We're going to talk about this in a minute. So how do we do that? I'm going to give you five little steps here of how that looks. Number one, in order for you to kill sin, you have to recognize you have sin. I mean, in order for you to know how to attack cancer, it's probably going to be a good thing for you to know that you have cancer. You know, in order for me to have gone through the last 11 years of treatment to figure out how to beat what was killing me inside, I needed to know that it wasn't a ringworm and it was B-cell lymphoma. Because the cream that I could have put on my face for the ringworm would not have done anything to stop the tumors that were inside of my body. So the first thing in order to kill our sin, there's a real practical step here where I think every single day as we're in the word and the spirit of the living God is in us, is that we ought to be in the business of diagnosing sin in our life. If you've got your Bibles, you don't mind open up. Open up to Hebrews chapter 4. Very familiar passage of Scripture. Hebrews chapter 4. And I want to read verses 11, 12, and 13. This pastor, anonymous pastor of Hebrews, is writing here, and he's writing to, for the same purpose, he's writing to people who are scattered during the wilderness. Here's what he says as you're flipping there. He says in verse 11, Let us therefore strive to enter that rest. <clears throat> He's saying the same thing. We have to fix our eyes on the promised land, which is where we're going to. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For, so he's talking about this idea of sin, disobedience. For the word of God is living and active. And here's the imagery I want you to have in your mind. The word of God is living and active and it is sharper than any two-edged sword 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 and here's what a sword has the ability to do just like the word of god piercing to the division of the soul and spirit of joints and marrow and discerning the thoughts and the intention of the hearts we have just covered what the word of god does you know what it probes into your life and it do and it discerns look at the two things it discerns the very things that we're talking about right now this heart and my thoughts and my mind the intention. It probes into the thoughts and the intentions of the heart and no creature is hidden from its sight but all are naked and exposed in the eyes of whom to whom we must give an account. Let me tell you what we do when we dive into the word of God. It will because the spirit of God lives in us and it will illuminate his word and we'll be able to see it clearly. It's going to help diagnose sin in your life. It is like not a sword. It's more like I think of a scalpel precision man it will the word of god will you, you would be ignorant to it the more time you spend in the word of god let me just warn you the more you know god the more acutely aware of your sin you will be let me tell you what has happened in my life 20 years ago i used to journal i look back at my journal entries from 20 years ago while i was a believer way more sin way more rampant in my life interestingly though while there was way more sin and it was way more rampant in my life it bothered me not nearly as much as it does now I mean, it bothered me, but not really. Today, God has done a wonderful thing. While the, all of those sins are probably prevalent in my life, some are very few and far between, and it has been almost killed. They're on life support in a lot of areas. But you know what? Even though it's way less, bothers me infinitely more. The more I understand and set my attention on the hope for me, the more I come to know Jesus, the more I understand how infinite our God is, it makes my sin look infinitely disgusting horrible the spirit convicts me of that thing it's a scalpel you open the word of god and dive in it yes it will grow your faith but it is also going to do exploratory surgery in your life with regard to sin you will discover things that you didn't even know were sin are sin you'll discover that just it's not a matter of even the things you do you'll go read james and it'll say knowing the good things you ought to do and not doing it is sin that's in a direct quote from Jesus' half-brother. It's not just, oh, I did some things and it's sin. Sometimes I cannot do things that I'm supposed to do, and that is sin. And it uncovers that. 
So I want you to begin to ask some questions. How do we do that? How do I discover that? Here's how the word will work. And I think you marriage going through the word with some real practical questions. I want you to write these down and, and I'll give you these notes. But as you read the word of God, you know what you ought to add to your devotion time every day? I know it seems morbid. I want you to think about sin and how you discover it. I want you to ask some questions. Is there sin in your life? That's a great way to start. Let's just not assume that we're perfect. Sometimes we can be conceited and selfish and ego man. Add that to your list. As you read the Bible, Ask yourself that question and ask God to show you. Is there any sin in my life, God, that I'm not aware of? Make me aware of it. I think it's a wonderfully simple and practical thing to ask. Second thing you want to ask, maybe just take some time daily and say, God, is there any sin in my life? And then maybe once you identify it, is it habitual? Obviously, there's sin in our life. I want them to exploratory surgery and get in there on a scalpel level with the word of God. Separate joints, ligament, the intentions of my heart. Is this something that's happening every single day? Multiple times a day? Been going on for years and years and years? Is it habitual? There's a third thing I think we ought to apply if we're going to have any chance of killing it. I want to know if it's there. I want to know how serious it is. I want to know how I treat it. So here's the third question. Do you apply cheap grace to it? Anybody ever heard the term cheap grace? Anybody ever read Dietrich Bonhoeffer stuff? Anybody know who Dietrich Bonhoeffer is? Yes. Okay, if you've never read anything, you don't know who Dietrich Bonhoeffer is, let me start you out with Get the Cost of Discipleship and read it. It's going to mess with your life, I promise you. You pull it off the shelf every year and you're like, I don't want to read this, but I'm going <laughs> to. Unbelievable story. Go get Bonhoeffer, the, the biography, autobiography, and read it. It's incredible. But Dietrich Bonhoeffer is the one who really started talking about this idea of cheap grace. Cheap grace is this. It seeks to hide the cost of discipleship. There is a cost to discipleship. When I make a profession of faith and I get saved, here's the thing. It's uh, the beginning. It's not the end. It's a fight. Think about what this life is called. The journey with Christ isn't floating on the clouds. It isn't everything's okay. We're learning this in Peter. We look at the words Paul used. He said it's like a boxing match. It's a fight to the faith. He uses it like a runner running a, a marathon, a sprint, I'm fixing my eyes. But it's not an opera. It's not a movie theater. It's not a spectator sport. It's something that we jump into and we, it's hard work. And that's a, it's a fight. It's a hunt where I'm trying to hunt down and kill sin in my life through the power of the Holy Spirit. And cheap grace says this, well, all of my sins, they look in the short term and say, well, my sin is now separated as far as the east is from the west. So I'll just go sin it up. Who cares? It's covered, right? Because grace, grace is what we've been expended. Grace is getting something that I don't deserve. I have sin, and what I deserve is punishment. I'm not going to get it. Mercy, I don't get what I do deserve. Cheap grace would say, you know what? I'm covered. The blood of Jesus has covered me. And while that's true, it would say, you know what? I'm done. I'm going to sit on the couch now and sin it up because I'm covered. Paul addressed this. I'll read it for you. Romans 5, 20 through 21. He says, Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through the righteousness leading to eternal life. So he says, absolutely. Wherever sin is, grace is more. There is no, you cannot out sin God. He will apply his grace to all of your sin. Absolutely separates as far as the east is from the west. Removed from you. But listen to this. He didn't stop there. Romans 6, 1 through 2. People don't quote this one often as much. He says, while that is true, he says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Exclamation point here. He says, it's like him yelling, by no means. How can we who died to sin still live in? And he says, he's asking people, so what should we say? If we want grace to abound. I want people to see the grace of Jesus. And how is the grace shown to us covering our sin? So if I really want people to see the grace of Jesus, let's sin more because grace will be more. He says, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. Reminds us of what we already said. Salvation is by grace alone through faith. But it's more than just mouthing the words Jesus is Lord and Jesus is Savior. We're not saved by a profession of faith. I know this gets a little controversial for people, but it's true. I'm sorry. We're not saved just because I uttered a certain prayer and I said some certain words. I'm not saved because I said the sinner's prayer. I'm not saved because somebody made me regurgitate the ABCs accept, believe, and confess. Number one, nothing wrong with that, although I don't see ABCs even in the Bible. Jesus never told somebody to accept, believe, and confess. He says, I need you to uh, be crucified with Christ uh, uh, and sit in the electric chair and be crucified to yourself repent and 
walk away from your sin. We're saved with a living and an active faith, according to James chapter 2. A faith, and here's how that faith will be manifested. Here's how I know. We've already said this. A faith that's not tested is one that ought not be trusted. Period. It might just be words if it's never been tested. Our faith manifests itself in repentance, obedience, and love of God, and love of our neighbor. It will show up in what we do, walking away from sin. I know my faith is real when I am, sin is dying in my life, because that can't happen any other way other than genuine faith. I love this one commentator just reminder said salvation is not a transaction it's transformation so ask yourself do I treat sin like that like what's the big deal it's habitual I know I do it but you know the why I do that is because look I got my get out of hell jail jail uh, out of hell free card and it's covered and fourth thing you ought to ask what's your motivation to kill the sin maybe there's some people who are like I got sin I know I do it Maybe I want it to be killed. I'm not just sitting on the couch saying, let's let it keep going because Jesus saves it. But I think sometimes people do that even for the wrong reasons. There are some people who are just guilty because of sin and they're worried they're going to get caught. Is that your motivation for killing sin? Because you're worried that your wife might find out or your kids or your boss or people might see what you did online. I don't know. Is it that you're going to get caught or is it that your sin is robbing God of his glory? People would look at your life and not see Jesus at work. I'm going to choose the sin over Jesus. And so when the world looks at me, I'm doing damage to the testimony of God. I am going to rob God of his glory. Is it you're trying to kill the sin because you're worried about getting caught? Or do you hate the sin? Do you want to get rid of the sin because you really love the sin, but you don't want people to know you love the sin? Or you want to get rid of the sin because you hate it and you disgust it and it's something that the Lord that you serve and follow disapproves of? That's a real hard question, but it's, we ought to get real and ask those kinds of things. You start asking real questions like that, here's what you're doing. You're doing a diagnosis. You're lifting up the hood on your life, and you're saying, let's check out all these parts and figure out if they're all there. If there is a leak, what caused the leak? How serious is the leak? And what's the damage that can be done if I don't take this serious? We ought to do that with our sin. Once we've done that, let me give you a second thing we ought to do if we're going to have a chance of killing sin. And what does it mean to live a holy life and kill sin and to be holy as he's holy in our conduct? Once I've diagnosed it, here's what I would do. Is it a matter of fixing it? Let's say I've got some sin in my life. What do I do? I just take it out? I don't think it's so much take it out. I think the idea we see from Scripture is that I get in the Word and I replace it. I replace it. Let me just, we're going to get real... I'm assuming there's not like little ones watching us on TV. I'm going to get real with it. Let me just tell you something. Men, I am convinced from 23 years of ministry as a working with normally youth uh, boys. I remember my wife and I having a conversation one time. She just, uh, women, you're different than men. Men were different than women. It's just the way that it goes. And I remember having the conversation. She was talking about men and, and boys and teenagers struggling with lust. And she's like, sure, is that all guys? I'm like, it is. It, if I'm, I'm, maybe there's some that don't. I am convinced that if ever I had a teenager or an adult man come to me and be like, I just didn't struggle with lust, I'd be like, he's lying, straight up lying to my face. A liar. You got two problems, lust and you're a liar. Those are your problems. <laughs> to some degree, you're lying, man. I, it's a fight for men. And, and I would tell you right now is that you look at this and I think with men, so we'll look at problems that men have or, or things that you look at's going on. It's prolific right now. They're looking at things they shouldn't be looking at on the screen and you would think, I don't want that. One of the damaging things about that is that it's not just a matter of flicking off the screen. It's in there now. Every time you shut your eyes, it's there. How do I get it out? You don't just get it out. You have to replace it. Thomas Chalmers, the famous Puritan preacher, wrote a famous sermon. I have gone back to it so many times. And he, he wrote this sermon. The title of the sermon is The Expulsive Power of a Greater, some people say that, of a Better Affection. If I find that I have an affection for some sin in my life, it's not a matter. I love it. That's what we discover. I love this sin. The reason why it's in my life is not because I hate it. It's happening habitually and it's in my life is because I love it. We would never say that. I, I'm, it, my flesh is eating it up and loving it. It's not a matter of me saying, get rid of this thing you love, because really the chances are, no, you replace it with something that you have a greater affection for. Like Put your eyes, it comes back to the focus. Let me put my eyes on something greater. That's why we're given real specific commands. What are we supposed to do? I mean, what do Galatians say? Think about these things. He says, think about these things that are 
lovely and righteous and pure, good. You get in the word. Look, you're gonna have, it's going to take some time. You are going to have to replace it with something else. Replace it. So what do we do? The same thing. I get in the word. I start to grow my faith. It's kind of like you found out that you're climbing up a ladder with all of your paintbrushes and buckets because you've got to paint the side of this house. And it would be like getting up to level three and looking around and be like, uh-oh, th- this is the wrong house. This is not the right house. And you look over there and you're like, oh, that's the right house. It would be nice if you could just with all of your buckets and your paintbrushes be like, what is that, like 10 feet gap? I might be able to just jump and make it over there. That would be destructive. You know what you got to do? Sometimes you have to go all the way back down the ladder again. You got to, yes, you got to take some things out of your life and all that, but then you have to start climbing up the right wind kind of a deal. It's not just taking it out. I replace it. I'm going to replace it with a greater affection. If I find that I am loving sin, here's the truth. It's not just that I'm loving sin. It's that I'm not having my eyes focused on setting it fully on the hope that's before me. It's a diagnosis in my life of my walk with the Lord. Paul got to a place where he was able to say all things. What did he say? He made an accounting ledger. And he says, I've gotten to a place where I account everything as loss. That, that's, he didn't even say just sin. Everything, let's put everything, he said, in this column and say it's, matter of fact, he got a lot, he said it's garbage. I mean, he started talking about his sin. He started talking about things. He used kind of a foul word in the Greek, honestly. I consider it rubbish. That is not exactly the perfect translation of that word. But he says, I consider all things a loss compared to the one thing that's over here in this column. The all-surpassing power of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Compared to knowing Jesus, everything is loss. The more I know Jesus, look, I lose my taste and my love and my affection for lust, money, trinkets, myself, sin. I look at the more I know of Jesus, nothing can compare. Nothing. I think that gets to the heart of what Jesus said. Unless you hate your mother and father, you're not worthy to be called my disciple. It's not that we're supposed to hate our mother and father, but comparatively, he goes to the furthest ends. Cannot compare replace it we diagnose it and then i begin to work every single day and saying you know what i got a problem it means i need to know jesus more because i have i've somehow made jesus not as i've clearly lost sight of jesus because somehow i think this is more fulfilling and more desirable and more satisfying than jesus oh the more you know him it cannot compare and what it'll do is the more you you live through the lens of the word and you know jesus it just it's not a matter of taking something out you it's just out of your field of view you can't even see it anymore like it starts here and the more you get to know Jesus it starts moving in your peripheral vision you just keep growing in him it's gone you walk away from the Lord it starts to sneak back that's how it goes diagnose and replace is the second thing and here's the last one and this will make some sense this will be a weird thing I want you to tell you to do in order to keep that going is here's what I'm going to ask you to do in order to replace it you're going to have to set your sails with the word and the Holy Spirit. And here's why I use that word, set yourselves. You know, in Scripture, it is possible, according to the Bible, for us to grieve the Holy Spirit. Even though the Holy Spirit might be present in our lives, we're warned that we ought not grieve the Holy Spirit. What do you, what do you think that means? Anybody who's ever read the Bible, what does it mean to grieve the Holy Spirit? It's our last thing. What does it mean to grieve anything? What does it grieve the loss of somebody? What do we do? What do, image do you get in your mind? cry, be upset. Grieve the Holy Spirit. I mean, it's in the Bible. We should know what that means. We're, we're told, commanded that we shouldn't grieve the Holy Spirit. He lives inside of me. What does it mean I can grieve him? Grieving the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you what you do when you grieve the Holy Spirit. You live in such a way like he's not present in your life. Ignore him. Ignore him. And here's the thing that's interesting about that. It's, it's almost written in nautical terms. It's like when we grieve the Holy Spirit, we got all the tools. I'm in a boat. I have a sail. I've got a a hoist. I've got all this stuff. But when we grieve the Holy Spirit, here's what we do. We end up sitting here. It's just kind of like the elephant walking around. When I grieve the Holy Spirit and I don't pick up the sword that I've been given, you're just sitting in the sailboat here. The wind's going. Grieving the Holy Spirit. Here's the thing. The Holy Spirit is said that he's like the wind. 
We see that in Scripture. I don't know where he's coming from. I don't know where he's going. God wants to move us by the power of his spirit. To grieve him is to say, he's, the wind's blowing overhead. We're in the sailboat. Sail is down here in the thing, and I'm just sitting here ignoring it, not being moved. Still in my sin, not going anywhere, not being moved. There is no abundant life happening in my life. And here's what he's begging you to do. He's asking you to just pull up the sail, man. You got all the tools. Pull it up. I don't have to know where the Holy Spirit's going. The more I get to know Jesus, the more I increase my faith in the Word of God, the more I understand that the Spirit's there. When, when I open the Word that the Holy Spirit, oh, by the way, inspired, Second Peter says that the, the Word was carried along to men by the Spirit. They didn't just write what they wanted to. It was carried along by the Spirit. If I open the Word of God, here's what it'll do. It's like me hoisting up the sail. I don't know where He's going to take me. The wind catches it, though, and moves, moves us. The more you get in the word without you even knowing it. That's why it's called fruit of the Holy Spirit. Yes, I want to not be characterized by sin. What do I want to be characterized by? Fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I don't produce that. It's fruit of the Holy Spirit. The more I'm in the word, guess what will begin to pop up in my life? Not lust, not anger, not fear, not sin. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Set sail. Pull up that sail and let the Spirit work and move in our life. And that happens with the Word. Pull up the sail and let Him increase our faith. And you'll see, it's not like I have to manipulate this kind of a faith. It'll just start happening. You'll find yourself one day and saying, where did that sin? I'll look at my journal today and be like, how did this happen? Was it my plan that all this got killed? No. You know what I've been doing for the last 20 years? Getting to know Jesus better. And all of a sudden it's gone. There's a greater affection in my life. A greater affection. When we people, we harp on it as pastors and tell you, get in your word. I don't know anything more important to tell you. I, I don't, of all the seminary training and all of the days in the Bible, the most important things I can tell you almost are read your Bible and pray. I mean, I, let's go back to Sunday school 101. Read your Bible and pray and almost every single thing else will fall into place. It'll fall into place. I think we try to make things simple. Jesus said, seek, seek first the kingdom and I'll take care of all this other stuff. So you're worrying about all this stuff? Let's just make it simple like, Seek me first, seek me, and I'll take care of all this other stuff. Here's what we're, second thing we're going to be weird. He says, live holy lives, put sin to death, and here's what that do. If I can get my mind focused on him, here's what will follow. My heart. And then what I get passionate about, and what I am excited about, and what my heart is longing for, it, trust me. Trust me, it will affect your actions. What you do is just a an indicator of what, what, where your heart is. I mean, we know that even with the words that come out of our mouth. What I speak is an overflow of my heart. Your mind will shape your heart, and your heart will move your feet. If we're going to be able to move our feet and walk in a way of joy in the midst of trials, the first thing we start to do is this. Let me, get, let me roll up the sleeves and say, we better get serious. This is more than Bible knowledge. This is life. And let me pull up the sail here. I would encourage you to, if you're not, I'm probably preaching to the choir. You're sitting here on a Wednesday night listening to a pastor talk for an hour about the Bible. You, you can never have enough of it. Just like John Owen says, be killing sin or be killing you. Let me tell you something. It's the same way with reading the Bible. The, the, the more I open it, I have a chance to kill sin. Without it, dead meat. Dead meat. All right, I'll get these notes. If you're on my list, you're going to get all of this um, email to you. You probably get it tomorrow. You can rewatch this online. Um, if I don't have your email by some chance, or you know somebody who wants it, I've had some people who are like, I'm watching online, I don't have your email. Let me have their email. Email it to me, and they'll get the notes. And we'll be back here next Wednesday. Keep working our way through First Peter. Let me pray for us, and we are officially done. Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for your word. God, I'm thankful for it as I'm Saying it out loud, God, I just know that I needed this. I needed it. God, you knew that we should be here. Uh, in your sovereignty, God, you knew that this is where we needed to be. And so, Father, I pray that we take these words and they be more than just words. God, I know right now in this room, one thing we all share in common is uh, hopefully you, that we're brothers and sisters. I know this. We all have sin, every single one of us. We are all in this same fight. I pray that we we take it serious, that we would take what was given to us in Leviticus, but is also given to us by Peter, that we ought to be in the business of mortifying this flesh 
not physically, but God, just this nature you've given us. Put it to death. You've given us everything we need. It's your power. It's your word. You've given us the tools. Let's, let's use them, God. Let's not sit in that prison cell. Father, I just pray as we leave that we would do this because we know it's good for us, but we would do it for your glory. I don't want people to see you at work. I want you, them to see you at work in us, putting sin to death. I want them to see the gospel. We pray this, Jesus, as we leave, that you would guide us, grow us, convict us to be more like you, transform us into your image. We pray this, Jesus, because of you and in your name. And all your people said, amen. amen. Y'all have a good night. We'll see you next week, hopefully Sunday.